check out Paddy Power's latest golf offer. We're paying a whopping eight places at the US PGA. That's three more than the usual five. Paddy Power, you beauty. Applies to the place part of each way bets at one fifth of the odds. Excludes shops. 18 plus be gambleaware.org. TNC supply. What a very warm welcome to the Racing Post Cast Golf Special. Of course, we'll be looking at the final major of the year. It is the US PGA Championship. I'm Ed Quigley. I'm delighted to say I'm in the esteemed company of our resident in-house golf tipster, Mr. Ian Wilkinson. Join us on the line. Of course, you have the Racing Post Golf Guru. It is Steve Palmer and a man who knows a lot about tea to green, representing Paddy Power Bookmakers, is of course, Ian McGoughlin. Then... So then, gentlemen, before we get into the uh, the nitty gritty of the players, if you like, I'll, I'll go to you first, Wilco, in terms of the uh, course, Quail Hollow itself. Has yeah. had a few alterations since we last saw it. I mean, how do you see it shaping up? Yeah, it has. I mean, um, there's been... Um it, it, it's quite rare for the US PGA to be played on a course that um, takes its place usually on the PGA Tour. And it's uh, the um, the course at Quail Hollow in Charlotte, North Carolina, has been um, hosting the Wells Fargo Championship in its various guises for about the last 10 or 15 years. Um, there have been quite a few sort of course changes and um, it's um, lots of holes have been modified and lengthened. Um, to provide quite a stern test because they didn't play that tournament at, at the venue this year to give Eagle them point, wasn't it? To, yeah. Yeah, Eagle Point to afford them the opportunity to uh, sort you know get everything prepared. Um, it's quite a um, I think it's going to be the sort of course where big hitters are going to enjoy because while um, the greens are famed for being undulating and um, can provide some very difficult um, conditions. Um, there was a couple of the eighth and the fourteenth our par fours at both, you know, the big hitters, uh, yeah. the, the uh, Dustin Johnsons and Bubba Watsons of this world will be looking to get onto the green with their drives. And um, there are also another couple of um, par fives which um, should be reachable in two. And then when you add those up, you know, three or four shots, you know, that could make a big difference. Um, it was, having said that, it's not a course that looks like it could be particularly overpowered. It was the ninth hardest course that was played on the PJ Tour last last year in 2016. So I wouldn't expect anybody to blitz it and run away with um, playing particularly, you know, by tearing it apart. I can't see that happening. But um, there's some de a demanding end to the, to the uh, course, which involves uh, the last three holes known as the Green Mile, which include a... Uh, 223 yard par 3 17th, which I think I'll probably need my driver to <laughs> get anywhere near the. I need it someone driving a, the ball again. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and it involves a drive of more than 190 yards over water. I mean, not a lot to these fellas, but it should guarantee a bit of drama. Late drama. Indeed. Yeah. So, um, yeah, there's going to be plenty of The, the weather's play key to this, isn't it, Will? Yeah. I mean, the, 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 the amount of rain that's been falling there, because the, the most important change to the course since the, the Wells Fargo 2016 was the uh, the changes in the grass. It's now 100% Bermuda grass, which would have meant a much firmer, faster running course uh, mm. if we got standard August weather. But... Um, because it's been raining, raining so heavily, and uh, there that um, and of course some more the, rain. The, the sting, the sting's been taken out of the fairways and green. So I think it's quite a similar challenge to how it was in the 2016, uh, you know, in previous Wells Fargo. So it's still a bombers, a bombers track, because uh, the rough, the rough's not that severe. And that'll only uh, accentuate that. that. You know, the more rain you got, the more the big hitters are going to enjoy themselves. Well, it's interesting. Yeah, it does look a bombers, bombers paradise. I was going to say, Steve, it's interesting you should say that because uh, last year's winner, Jimmy Walker, was interviewed earlier in the week, and he said. With the amount of trees that have been taken out and the new greens, he just thinks you could see a lot of low scores uh, being shot, kind of a la Erin Hills. I mean, do you take that viewpoint? Yeah, I think they were banking on standard August weather. I mean, if it was hot and baking over there, then the course would be playing much different and uh, uh, it would have been a very interesting tournament. But now that, you know, it's, it's going to be um, plugged lies in the in the fairways and um, target goal from there. So, uh, yeah, I, I, I just see uh, I see a low score in Bombers Bombers track this week, and um, I think punters punters should be considering previous Quail Hollow course form as a definite positive, but maybe not essential given that it's, it's, it's a slightly different track now. The first five holes are, are, are much much tougher than they used to be. And Ian, we come to you. I mean, it's definitely going to be an interesting betting heat, isn't it? So, uh, I mean, give us an idea of how you're shaping up protagonists, and also anything a bit left of field that's being nibbled at at the moment. 
Of course, I'll run through the outright prices to start. So uh, Rory McIlroy heads the market at 13 to 2. Jordan Speed next in at 10 to 1. Hideki Matsuyama 11 to 1. Dustin Johnson 14 to 1. Ricky Fowler 16 to 1 and 25 to 1 bar. In relation to kind of outsiders who've been getting nibbled at, the likes of Charlie Hoffman's been quite popular with his two uh, two good finishes the last two weeks. I think he's more of a first round leader playing myself in terms of can he really see out a tournament to the death and especially in a cauldron like a USPGA Championship where the likes like the front four, the front five in the market are all going to be I'd say there come Sunday can he really have the stones to kind of take it down on Sunday evening I doubt it myself but that's where the, most of the cash is coming in as well and Zach Johnson again it's another one I'm kind of scratching my head at the more it rains the course gets longer and longer it's the more Zach Johnson kind of goes out of my mind in terms of a player. As the lads said previously, bombers should excel here. So those are the two for money at bigger prices. OK, Steve, uh, I suppose the, the first place to probably start is with Rory McIlroy. I mean, this season he's often been making the headlines for the wrong reasons, be it Twitter spats or well-documented injuries or even splitting out of his caddy, of course. But having said all that, he's got an excellent record at this venue and there's a bit of an upturn in form in recent weeks. I mean, how do you assess his claims? Yeah, the last couple of weeks, uh, well, the last couple of tournaments have been a bit more encouraging, but um, I just think the price is off-putting for me. I mean, I was planning a long way out. I was playing a big chunk on Rory for this week. Uh, if doing, your, doing your major multiples at the start of the year, it did look like a penalty kick if he was in any sort of form uh, because of his fantastic Quail Hollow record. But um, I just wonder whether that might backfire this week. He seems to be putting a lot of pressure on himself. He's been uh, billed as the man to beat by Jordan Spieth. I, I think it's quite a lot on his shoulders this week, and I wonder he might buckle under it. Uh, I don't think he's playing quite well enough to um, to deliver. His short irons have been poor for a while. His, his putting's still very inconsistent. Lots, um, lots of putter switches. Um, Fitness-wise, I think he's back at full fitness. But uh, yeah, there's too many negatives for the, for the price for me. I mean, he's going into battle with a, without a proper caddy again. I think last week, you know, he had his little bit of fun with Harry Diamond. It was all, all smiles playing with his, his, his best mate. But yeah, this is a serious, serious business now. This is major competition. This is what Rory lives with. I think he'll be on a much, you know, but he might be on a much shorter fuse. I think um, the novelty will quickly wear off of him having uh, his, his mate on the bag. And, um, yeah, I think if he gets off to a good start, um, Rory will contend. But I've I got a feeling if he gets off to a poor start, it could, could unravel mentally, you know. I used to win my seven shots round here with JP, you know. So, uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah I, I think if... The, <laughs> I, th I do think the caddy thing is more important than people realise. I think if, if, if it starts, if the atmosphere sours early doors between those two, and um, yeah, I think Rory really expects to play well. And if he doesn't get going early, I think he might um, mentally unravel. He's got he's got to start quickly for um, for me, McElroy. You know, he's never. I never see him as a sort of player who's going to come out of the pack and make a charge. He just doesn't... He's a confidence it. player, yeah. isn't he? I, and when, when because, well, it's not necessarily the co the confidence. I think it's the other end of the mental scale. It's that when things don't go right, he is prone to... Oh, well, that's it. That's another major Yeah, he's, he's like Ronnie O'Sullivan. Oh, he's a yeah. mercurial, mercurial talent. And that, um, he's there to when, win it, When things yeah. are going yeah. well, he's a good front runner. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I want a bit more of my favour for the price. Yeah, I've got to agree, really. I think... Um, I was going to say, Wilco, is he the right favourite for you? As first, first question. Probably. Right. Yeah, because, I mean, he's won round there twice. And um, we we had a chat on here before the Open. And um, I, no, I put it to the lads, you know, what sort of price would you consider him to be backable to win at, um, at Birkdale? And they're saying, oh, I wouldn't touch him at 40 to 1. And it was like, you know, this is Rory McIlroy we're talking about. Now he's on a track. He's improved. He showed doing, himself. Rory McElroy. He showed himself. He had a bad first nine holes and then played really well yeah. for the rest of the tournament. He had a good week last week at Firestone. Um, so I'm not. I think he was always going to be at the top because of his um, course record. I'm a bit like Steve. I think he's a little bit. I I, I do concern myself with his um, mental condition really, um, whether he's got it in the bag to grind it out if things don't go right, particularly with a change of his circumstances with, um, you know, his, with his caddy. Um, it does help that he's been around before, obviously, yeah. and he's had success, form, you know. Yeah, yeah. It's not just, you know, he's not programmed by a caddy who tells him what to do, absolutely everything. You know, he's capable of making his own mind yeah. up and he will be boosted by the fact that he has performed well at the venue before. But having I don't said think anyone that, should be a single-figure prize, Ted. I think right. um, it's a really ultra-competitive yeah. affair. Um, so I wouldn't be backing anyone at single figures. OK, then. Um, well, then, let's cut to the chase then, I suppose. I mean, Steve, who is going to win it? Or at least, who's not going to win it? Who's going to get involved at the final day at big odds? 
We yeah, it's a great question. I I, I see uh, Ricky Fowler. I think it's a fantastic opportunity for Ricky Fowler to land the the major. His talent undoubtedly deserves. I mean, you forget how good this this lad was as a youngster. He was uh, earmarked for superstardom from an early age. World number one amateur for thirty seven weeks. And um, you know, I think people put a bit too much. Uh, stock in the fact he hasn't won a major at the yeah, age of 28 I mean he's still a young man he becomes a divisive character yeah. over that doesn't it really in terms of better yeah, perspective yeah he's, he's still, a, still a very young man at the age of 28 he's won plenty of US tour titles he's won a couple of European tour events I mean what, what do people expect from uh, from people I mean Sergio Garcia 37 it, when he when he won his first major so what um, had we done by the time we were 28 so? <laughs> 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 what have we done now <laughs> what have we done now we're almost, how old are you Wilco um, <laughs> he's only a failure isn't he Ricky Fowler I mean, <laughs> yeah. But go back to Fowler. You, you, I mean, obviously he's got some good form at Quail Hollow, and he, he should have the perfect game for the course. Exactly, exactly. People are getting very excited about Rory McIlroy's record, but Ricky Fowler's got a fantastic Quail Hollow record. It, you know, his maiden U.S. Tour title came at Quail Hollow in 2012, so he's got very fond memories of the place, and he beat McIlroy in a in a playoff for that um, for that title. Um, I, yeah, I think Fowler will play with plenty of self-belief this week because he knows he, he can perform at Quail Hollow, and I think that's probably been the difference between him finishing off some of these these majors, you know, he's got a bit twitchy, but I think he knows he can win at Quail Hollow, and um, I think he's got as good a chance as anyone. Oh, this is going to be a real make-or-break tournament for Ricky Fowler, I think, with this um, moniker that he's um, earned as the, um, you know, the best player the never to have won a thing, because um, this is where he is expected to perform well. You know, if he doesn't win this one, then, put, oh, well, if he can't win at Quail Hollow, well, that's what Hollow, I was going to say, to play Devil's Advocate, Hollow, is he going to be able to... Do you do think, think it weighs on his mind? No, I think he'll thrive on it. Right. I think that I think that will give him a boost, and um, he, you know, he is a top player, and you know, as Steve says, he's performed well at the venue before, which should, should give him a massive boost. Solid, seems settled in his game. Um, he's I finished just, in the top five in every major, yeah, each of the four majors. I mean, that's he's a solid major performer. He just hasn't got over the line in front, but as I say, he won on this course and it's his time. I think I just think it's his time this week. Right, I so just think he's going to be. He's the best challenger of the ones at the top of the market. Okay, so Stephen Wilco in agreement on Ricky Fowler at the top of the market. Ian, I mean yourself. Uh, again, we've been talking about the big hitters going well. Previous course form, uh, yeah. not with the kind of the nudges and the nerdlers like the Zach Johnsons. I presume you're uh, taking that viewpoint too. Absolutely. I was saying to the guys before I came on air, call me uh, Pastor McLaughlin now for the next few minutes because I'm going to convert a lot of people now to back Rory McIlroy here. So I'll just start... Um... I'm with you, I'm with you. But carry on. Yeah. Yeah, the sold, uh, sold. Yeah, sold already. <laughs> <laughs> the two top five finishes at the Open and the Bridgestone have converted me back onto the, the Rory train. Come to Quail Hall now. This is his backyard. He'll be here, chest out going, this is my house here. You gotta, you gotta go very, very low to try and beat me around here. And I think the Harry Diamond caddy Steve is right in the sense of it does start turning at the start of the front nine, maybe. But I think this will invigorate him again. It's a good, good friend in the bag. I think I could caddy from around here, and he'd probably go very well. You know, another stat that I like is uh, he's made the cut here in six out of seven years, and the six events that he made the cut. He's been beaten by a total of 20 golfers in those six tournaments with form figures of 1, 2, 10, 8, 1, 4. Another thing that brings me to him is this is a, a driver's golf course. There's another stat that I found was with five of the last seven winners of Quail Hall, they all led the field in strokes gained off the tee. Rory currently leads the tour in strokes gained off the tee. He was second last week at Firestone. We discussed it at the Open that he couldn't really utilise his biggest weapon around Birkdale, hence why we want to take him on. Here, he can wield his driver wherever he wants. There's a little bit more room with the trees coming down, as the lad said. Soft fairways, he can kind of power and not have, worry about running out of fairways and such. And I think he, he can open up his shoulders, and that's when he's at his best, really. Uh, back to the lads concerning with the wedges. With a rain softened 7,600 yard course, I don't think there'll be too many wedges for second shots into greens. Like the course is going to be playing very, very long. So I think Rory probably averaged between seven, maybe eight to five iron and par fours, par fives. He's even taken a wedge out of his bag this week and added in a three iron for the par fives. Uh, looking through the stats rankings for the last five years around Quail Hollow, he's he tops every stat ranking that is uh, associated with the course and he's even in the top 20 in strokes game putting in this time frame an indication he, as we've already seen with his two wins he's very very comfortable on the, on the greens um, and whenever a, a long course gets hit with rain you look to guys like McRoy they just love it like he's won he won the PGA at Valhalla 
everyone was looking, jumping on the back of him when it started raining at the start of the week, and he duly obliged, beating the likes of Ricky Fowler, of Phil Mickelson, and Henry Stenson, uh, Henrik Stenson down the stretch. Sorry. And as the course gets longer, the more the rain comes. I think he hardens as favourite. I think he's, I think he's one of the bets of the year. To be honest, myself. One of the bets of the year. So I suppose the panel yeah. are split between the likes of Ricky Fowler and Rory McIlroy. Uh, come back to you, Steve, uh, to go for those uh, outside the protagonists, if you like. I mean, where's your money going? You want some outsiders? Yeah, go on, mate. Far away. Yeah, I'm on three Americans who uh, fit into the outsider category: Kevin Chappell, Kyle Stanley, and Robert Streb. I think a good each way bet. Uh, Chapel's been one of the best players on the US Tour for a few years now, but um, yeah, just couldn't get over the line in front. But he got his first win in April, won the Texas Open, walked with plenty of swagger since then. Uh, I think more titles are inevitable for Chapel. He's, he's that good. Yep. And um, his tee to green game is, is good enough to nail a stateside major, I think. Right. Um, he, all his best major form is uh, in the States. He finished third in the 2011 US Open, uh, which was played in similar conditions to what he faced this week. Uh, Ian talking about uh, Rory McIlroy being a mudlark. Well, McIlroy won that 2011 US Open at Congressional when it was it, it was a drenched course, and um, uh, Chapel finished third in that one. Right. And uh, he, he, he was finished seventh in the Masters this year. He's a proven major performer. Um, Ticks the boxes at the price, basically. Oh, very much so. Got some decent quail form in the book as well. And his, his last two starts, very encouraging. His driving was absolutely sublime at the Canadian Open and uh, finished strongly last week at Firestone. So Kevin Chappell would be probably the best outsider. And then uh, bigger prices, Stanley and Streb. Stanley won his, his second US Tour title last month, uh, the Quicken Loans National. Stanley's game based on tee to green excellence, tops the US Tour greens and regulation stats. Uh, needs to be followed on difficult layouts like Sawgrass. He was fourth at Sawgrass. And uh, he's got some Quail Hollow form in the book. Finished sixth at Quail Hollow in 2013. And uh, Streb's got even better Quail credentials. Fourth in 2015. Um, and both Streb's previous US PGA spins have uh, yielded a top 10 finish. So horses, um, so, horses are uh, course, course form, hit. tournament form. And uh, finished runner-up in the Greenbrier Classic a month ago. So he's, he's got some current form in the book as well. I think uh, Streb's a very lively runner at 300 to 1. I was surprised... Uh, how, uh, how big he was. I'm sure that price won't be along for, around for long. Uh, Wilco, come for you. Something left to field. Someone perhaps, you know, been totally yeah, forgotten. Yeah, I think there's a bit of scope for that because um, of them, of the players that are normally sort of like around the 40, 33 to 50 to 1 mark that I like to get sort of like involved in. I can't really get too excited about many of the runners in that bracket. Um, I do, um, I think Tony Finau could no, um, yeah. p play well. He can... He hits it a long way. If he gets his putter going, I think he could yeah. have a good week and he might give you an each-way shout at about, I think he's 80 to 1 yeah. with Paddy's. And um, the other one I like is uh, Brendan Steele, right. who I think is worth a poke at 125. Um, he's a solid tee to green performer. And um, he's had a decent season. He's put in a he he won the Safeway Open, which was one of those like after the FedEx playoffs, right at the beginning yeah. of the um, season that jumps over the two calendar yeah. years. Um, but um, even recently, he's he's played well in some of the big tournaments. He finished sixth at the Players and the thirteenth at the US Open. Um, so you know he knows what it's like to be involved at the right end of these tournaments. And um, he's got some decent course form too. He's uh, been ninth from fourteenth. In the last two years at Quail Hollow, so and I'm a little bit, yep. yeah, I'm a little bit surprised to see him as big as 125. He's bit actually, he's bigger elsewhere in the village at, than 125. But I think he's he's worth a good each way shout with all the places that are available. Yeah, and Ian, a cup to you. I mean, if you take your put your punting hat on away from a bookmaking perspective, uh, is there anything in there at three figure odds? You, I know you think Rory's uh, one of the bets of the year, but uh, could you see some really challenging him late on Sunday at three figure odds? Uh, there's nothing at three figures that really take my There's two kind of the 60 to 1 to 80 to 1 bracket. One's been mentioned by Wilco. The first one actually is Daniel Berger. Yeah. He's played uh, two times at Quail Hollow, uh, finishing 28 in 2015 and 17th in 2016. So it looks to be nice progression, uh, getting used to the course. He's in great form in the past six weeks with a win, a second and a fifth place finish. He was 17th last week to Bridgestone. He ranked uh, eighth in the strokes game tee to green as well. It's a stat that I'm kind of link, uh, putting my hat on uh, all week. I feel his all-around game would be suited to the test pose by Quail Hollow. He's been in interviews this week. He's been wax lyrical about how much the course suits his eye. He's a fader of the ball and he goes, this kind of suits me off the tee more so than most courses on the PGA Tour. So he's one I like at around the 60 to 1 mark. And the second one Wilco just mentioned was Tony 
for now. Uh, the big hit in American, he's having an excellent year in the PGA Tour. Uh, three top se- two top seven sorry, in his last three starts, a bomber in his element. He ranks fourth in strokes gained off the tee this season. Back to Steve's point about Streb's affiliation with the PGA, Fino's had uh, two goals. He was 10th in the PGA at Whistling Straits in 2015. I think, as Wilco said, if his putter stays somewhat lukewarm, I think he can go very well at a big price. Interesting that. I mean, I thought Justin Thomas has perhaps been slightly forgotten considering he hits it a mile. But anyway, mm. coming up after this short break, uh, Ian will be here with some uh, some big prices for the alternative markets at Quail Hollow. Check out Paddy Power's latest golf offer. We're paying a whopping eight places at the US PGA. That's three more than the usual five. Paddy Power, you beauty. Applies to the place part of each way bets at one fifth of the odds. Excludes shops. 18 plus begumbleware.org. TNC supply. You're back on the Racing Post Cast Golf Special, looking at the US PGA Championship. Of course, Ian Wilkinson, Steve Palmer and Ian McLaughlin uh, alongside me to join me here. Then, um, Ian, we'll come to you. I'm sure you're going to give me a, a plethora of sexy markets now. I mean, you've got top Europeans, top Americans. I mean, there was an even rumour going around that after Justin Thomas's sartorial elegance at the Open, you're going to have a price on someone to wear a tie on the first tee. Is that true? <laughs> Uh, it's not true from myself. Now, there's a what odds paddy capability there. You can tweet, you can message, they'll price that for you, no problem. I might stay away from that one because I don't want to be Monday morning, why are we X price of someone to wear a tie like, on Thursday morning? Or so I'll stay clear of that one. Fantastic. But I mean, what, the, the, the serious markets then, basically. Yes. Uh, top European, top American. I mean, how, how do you bet? I'll run through uh, the top US first. So uh, Jordan Speed has the market of five to one. Dustin Johnson next in at thirteen to two. Ricky Fowler eight to one. Brooks Kupka twelve to one. Justin Thomas twenty to one and twenty five to one bar. I was going to say it's not really a course for Speed, is it? In just in my humbled opinion. Yeah, I'd agree. Like there's a lot, there's a lot of negative starting to pile on top of him with the course getting lengthy. Actually. He somehow does well on these kind of longer courses, but I think with the rain softened ground, he's not the best driver of the golf ball, as we saw at points around Burkdale. Um, history is on his shoulders. It, no, I don't think so. History's on his shoulders this week, on trying to be the youngest player to do the career grand slam. Like his best part of his game, might be in, is the six inches between his, between his ears, but I think that. Uh, sorry, mix with the course not really suiting him. I think I think he can be the puzzle in most markets. He's week. such a he's such a good putter, but I think at the prices he's just too short this week. He's yeah. only played Quail once in his thirty second. He finished there. Yeah, right. twenty thirteen. Yeah. spin there. Yeah. yeah, and as Ian says, he's not a great driver. This is a driver's track, very much so. And he only gets one crack at this uh, youngest Grand Slam winner in the history it. thing. You know, he's. Yeah. Um, he, he has to do it now or never. That's a fair bit of pressure. I know he's a cool dude, but um, you know he, 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 he's going for history here and he, you get one crack at yeah. it. Yeah. Steve, you got any involvement in that type of market at all? Top American. It's always so difficult, and it is again this, this time. I, I think Fowler and Brooks Cook are the best bets, but I won't be getting involved. Right, don't leave them out of the prices. Wilco, yourself? Yeah, I'd agree with Steve that Fowler, I've got Obviously Fowler, Fowler yeah, and Cook yeah, yeah. would be the pick of the bunch, but um, five places available, I think. That, yeah. Phil Mickelson might be worth a bit of an each-way poke at 33-1. Wow, 40, 47, but he loves it. He's there, got, he, he loves yeah. it around there. He's, got, he's finished in the top 12 with nine in the last 10 years. It's like Quail an old Hollow. Sheltenham horse who just comes about year after year and delivers. Yeah, really, yeah. yeah, yeah. first racing reference from Ted Wade. <laughs> in, uh, <laughs> I had to do it. I had to do 22 it. 22 minutes. Had to be Cheltenham, um, <laughs> Cheltenham in August. <laughs> <as well. laughs> We're all thinking about it, mate. Um, yeah, so the course suits him. I mean, he might look at... He, he didn't play in the US Open, did he? And he missed a cut at the Open, but... Um, I think he could throw. I mean, 33 to 1 on a player of his quality with five places available. I think that's worth a few quid. Indeed. And uh, Ian, come to you for the top European. I mean, this might be a little bit more interesting if you take kind of Rory out of the equation. Sure. So uh, Rory has the market, obviously, at 9 to 4. John Ram next in at 9 to 1. Justin Rose, 12 to 1. Sergio Garcia, 12 to 1. Paul Casey, 14 to 1. And 16 to 1 bar. I suppose John Rahm fits the category as a, a big hitter. Uh, I come to you, Steve. I mean, the one thing that's been questioned about him is perhaps his, his temperament uh, to kind of forget the previous shot that's ended up in the water type syndrome. I mean, do you share that viewpoint? I mean, is he a major winner, major winner very soon or do you need more time to progress, do you think? I think he's a major winner within five years. Right. I think this is a very straightforward test this week and I think Rahm will play well. I, I think in the top European market, Rahm and Thomas Peters, probably the value, uh, double-figure prices. Uh, Rory, an ob- obvious favourite, but if, 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 um, if McElroy underperforms, then I would expect Rahm or Peters to, um, to take that market. Um, uh, um, I like a player that we, um, we, I put up for um, top Englishman in the... Um, 
US Open. He Go didn't on. let me down. Tommy Fleetwood. Oh, Tommy, yeah, yeah. Um, I think he's a good way to poke here at 18 to 1. Um, he had a great US Open, as I've just mentioned. Um, but he's been in such terrific form. Yeah. Um, a straight, straight long hitter. You know, this could this could suit him this week. Um, he's not played at Quail Hollow before. but um, And he's missed the cut in the last two US PGAs that he's played in. But having walked off him when he won the French Open when he'd missed the four cuts before that yeah, he'd played yeah, in yeah, that yeah. tournament. Um, I'm not too worried about that, so no, um, no. I've learned my lesson. We, we got a price on Fleetwood uh, there, Ian? I've got 18 to 1, I think. 18, 18, 18, 18 to 1. 18 yeah. to 1. And we'll come back to you then, Ian, on that. I mean, is there any other market you're in the Paddy Power offices, uh, anything peculiar you've been seeing uh, money for? Other than that, not really. The kind of make miss cuts have been popular. Lads, people have been back in the kind of the top end, like the likes of um, Adam Scott, Jason Day, DJ to make the cut, uh, to miss the cut. Oh, I thought you were going to say uh, all in on Danny Willett then. I thought we, <laughs> <laughs> no, we, we steer clear of that one. That's one that never gets put up anymore. Yeah. We get a price on Willett. It's like no, uh, uh, <laughs> no chance, no chance. But that's the kind of the the stranger yeah. kind of lesser markets that people are kind of getting involved. And the guys who are like a little bit out of form or some doubts with their in with niggling and injury stuff like that, they're kind of taking a few points and they missed the cut. Right, they, brilliant. Yeah, go on, carry on. They will, I mean, people will back popular, uh, surely, uh, Ian, people will pack, back popular golfers regardless of sort of like what form they're in. So they, yeah. you, you have to have them at the top of the list even if they're playing terribly. That's right. it. The punter's cash will be the front end, your market names. Well, a little bit more astute, shrewd kind of guys would be kind of, well, he's not playing that well or he's uh, tweaking his back. So I'll take a, I'll take a punt at, say, 7-2 to two for D Jason Day to miss the cut. Like, so, yeah, that's the kind of... You could go 2-1 to one more to catch. win the tournament and still have a, a, an army yeah, absolutely. of backers, couldn't you? That's it. That's, <laughs> it. that's it. Absolutely. I'll be one that's of them, too. <laughs> he's going back in at twos. <laughs> go on, son. Go on. Go on. <laughs> Even money, Michael. Who wants it? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right then, gents. It's, uh, it's time to nail your colours to mask. We're going to have a little drum roll and then we'll look for the best bet out of any of the markets. This will <coughs> not be beaten. Ian Wilkinson, your uh, best bet at the US <coughs> PGA oh, Championship. My best bet. Now, we love Charlie Hoffman on here. We always used to put him up for a first round leader. And um, on. I'm not in a position where I'm going to desert him. Now he's playing out of his boots. Um, he was he lost in a playoff at the Canadian Open and fur, and was third in more illustrious company at Bridgestone last week. And he's playing so well. 17 of his last 20 rounds have been in the 60s. Now, the negatives. Go on. He's not played at Quail Hollow since 2011. But 2013 was when the significant renovations had happened. So I'm willing to... Pass that one by a little bit. Dismal record in the US PGA. You're filling me with confidence. He's here. missed the cut in seven of... <laughs> Terrible haircut. Te yeah. seven, <laughs> seven of the last eight goes he's had at the US PGA. Yeah. He's missed the cut. Right, okay. But, but. different courses, different places. First the man in form, four Henry to one. He spat with his caddy as well on Sunday night. Didn't you see that? Four he, to one. Caddy yeah. wanted him to lay up, and he, 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 he was very confident. Tired to finish second. Yeah. Four yeah. to yeah, one yeah. to finish in the top ten. Four five to one. with Paddy Power. Five to one elsewhere. Right, Charlie Hoffman to, to figure seriously for that one. Uh, Ian, we'll come to you. Your best bet for the tournament? Bar Rory in the outright, I would say. Um, Tony Finau, top 20, I think, uh, for the points I gave earlier. I think he's going to have a big week now. I think this is going to be his kind of his coming out week to the kind of lesser lesser uh, punter who doesn't really watch golf week in, week out. He's kind of a name who will kind of get a, a big uh, big setting this week uh, around, uh, around Quail Hollow. Excellent. And, uh, of course, it is your catchphrase. So, Mr. Steve Palmer, the best bet? Uh, yeah, I'm going to go in the top 20 market as well. I think Robert Streb at 12 to 1 is, uh, is, is full of juice. I mean, he's finished in the top 10 in both his previous US PGA starts. His last three Quail Hollow starts have yielded results of 23, 4 and 28. Right. And uh, as I said earlier, yeah, that runner-up finish in the Greenbrier only a month ago. So I think Streb's got a lot going for him and has been completely dismissed as a total no-hoper, but that's not the case. Well, I'm a Rory fan. Uh, I think Justin Thomas uh, outside that could go well at a decent price. But anyway, thanks for joining us. It's been a pleasure to... Um, uh, my pleasure's steamed, all ours, Ted. Steam gentlemen, uh, Mr Ian Wilkinson, <laughs> Mr Steve Palmer and Ian McLaughlin from Paddy Power. Thank you at home for joining us. Remember, please rate our shows, leave a review and subscribe on iTunes. See you again soon. Check out Paddy Power's latest golf offer. We're paying a whopping eight places at the US PGA. That's three more than the usual five. Paddy Power, you beauty. Applies to the place part of each way bets at one fifth of the odds. Exclude shops. 18 plus. Be gamble aware. Talk to NC Supply.